All right, so Philemon, we have been talking about the um, famous and infamous from Scripture. Men and women, couples that we see scripturally, um, good, bad examples, things that we can learn, things that we can take away. And we've been looking at different characters. So last week we were talking about who? Queen of Sheba, okay, see, I'm, I'm glad that somebody remembers that. Right. So last week we were talking about Queen of Sheba, uh, and I've been having several people have just come up and said, hey, can we look at these different names? And so tonight we're going to be looking at the character of Onesimus. So that is why you are there in Philemon, um, because that is the primary place where we learn about the character of Onesimus. So when we're coming to these, whether it is a lot of information or a little information, we're always asking the same three questions. We're asking who were they, um, why do we know them, and then what lessons do they teach us? So when we're asking who are they, we're asking biographical, factual information, and then why do we know them as far as why does their life or their personality or their character, why does it stick out to us in Scripture, and then we talk at the last part about what are some lessons that we can learn from their life, their model, or their example. So we've already gone through the big ones, you know, that there are pages and pages and chapters and chapters of information about them. And so we're not necessarily scraping the bottom of the barrel. We're, we're getting on some names that are lesser known. And some of the reason why they're lesser known is because there's less amount of information available about them. So just to give you an idea, does anybody in the room know how many times the name Onesimus is written in the New Testament? I think two. You say two. Why do you say two? I'm it up. <laughs> okay, so she looked it up. All right, so do you... Okay, good job, Miss Lita. All right, so do you remember where those two places are at? No, I don't. Okay, well, that's fine. So, <laughs> so you will find... You will find the name Onesimus only two places. You'll find it once here in Philemon 10. There's only one chapter. So when we're saying Philemon 10, we're referring to verse 10 because there's not multiple chapters of the letter of Philemon. All right. So you will see it one place in Philemon 10. And I think the other place is in Colossians chapter 4, um, verse 9. So there's only two places that you see the name Onesimus given. So... What I want, what, why I preface that is because when we come to this, sometimes you will get where you're listening to Bible teachers or Bible speakers and they may spend two or three hours talking about Onesimus. And they might have been able to dig up and mine up that much information. But sometimes the danger is, is people start filling in with their opinions and what they've heard and wise tales and legends. So what I try to do in here on Wednesday nights is just simply stick to what the Bible says. And if it's 10 minutes, it's 10 minutes. If it's 30 minutes, it's 30 minutes. But just what the Bible says, not what every commentator on the shelf puts out and thinks about. So when we think about who Onesimus is, it can be a pretty small category about what we know about him or even why we know him in Scripture. So let's ask that first question. Who was he? What do we know about him factually or biographically? He was a slave. How do we know that? Okay. Does anybody remember where? Philemon 10. You sure? You sure? Maybe 16. Maybe 16. I'll I, I take 16. I'll, I'll accept 16. Yes, so Shaney and Moe's right. So we infer, because if you're looking there at Philemon 16, um, Paul says, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother. So we get the idea, we get the understanding that Philemon was a slave. Now that bondservant, if you uh, spend very much time, there's a lot of different um, variations of the picture of a slave. Um, sometimes you were a slave because you couldn't provide for your own self, and so you actually sold yourself into slavery, slavery so that you could be provided for because you had debt. Sometimes that you were a slave because you were born into a family um, that were considered to be slaves. Sometimes you were a slave because of some type of a punishment or some type of a criminal um, 
consequence that you were now a slave. And so sometimes when you come across some of those, and, and a lot of times they'll tell you in the translation philosophy what they're trying to do with it, but when he says a bond servant, it's actually doulos, which is translated as slave. He's actually saying that these people, um, he was a slave. Now, was he a slave by choice or was he a slave by force? Um, sometimes that can be a little bit harder to differentiate, but he does say, Paul says he was or is a bond servant. Some of you may have a little bit of a superscript or a, a footnote there that will come down and say it was a doulos, which was a slave. And that is a common rendering. You'll see where they talk about a slave and they'll use that coming from that word doulos. They'll even use the word doulos talking about how Christians should be slaves to Christ in the metaphorical spiritual sense. And so you'll see that from time to time. Okay, so we know that he was, um, that Philemon was, well, I'm sorry, Onesimus was a slave. So he was a slave of who? Philemon. Philemon, I kind of jumped the gun there. So when we're thinking about Onesimus, sometimes I, I get confused because we're in the letter of Philemon and we're talking about Onesimus. So Onesimus was allegedly a slave of Philemon, which means that Philemon was wealthy enough to either have slaves or had a big enough estate to have slaves. So there in 16, he talks about no longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you both in the flesh and in the Lord. So as Paul is writing this, he is talking to Philemon about Onesimus. And he is trying to make an assertion about who Onesimus was. What else do we know about Onesimus? Do we know where he's from? Any idea where he's from? Colossae, that's right. So he's from Colossae. You say, well, Spence, why do we know that he is from Colossae? Well, because when we think about what we know about Philemon and what we know about the history of Philemon and even up there in the first couple of verses, it talks about an Aphia and Archippus and talking about their home and talking about Philemon. We understand that all this most likely was taking place in Colossae. And we can, do, we can determine that by cross-referencing it with the letter to Colossians. So as Paul is writing to the churches in Colossae, there's some similarities that then follow those patterns. So we can understand from, if we go back and look at the four chapters of Colossians and uh, cross-reference with Philemon, we know that Onesimus was a slave and he was from Colossae. Now, how would they have in Colossae ever heard about Jesus Christ or ever heard about Paul? Any ideas on how that would have happened? So Colossae, if you think about geographically, you have what is modern-day Turkey. Ephesus is on the Mediterranean Sea on the western side of what is now modern-day Turkey. Colossae is approximately 100 miles to the east inland of Ephesus. We know from Acts chapter 19 that Paul spent over two years at Ephesus. It is thought, assumed, theorized that while Paul is in Ephesus for two years, that either Epaphras, who is mentioned there in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 7, either Epaphras was in Ephesus and heard about Jesus in the gospel and then went to Colossae and told Philemon and spread the news to Philemon, or Philemon was in Ephesus and took it back to Colossae. Either way, when you get up there to Philemon verse 2, Paul says, as he's writing this to Philemon, he's referring to him, possibly his wife, possibly his son, and talks about the church that is in their house. But there's no indication in the letter to Philemon that Philemon and Paul had ever met face to face. So there are Bible scholars, the majority of them think that Paul knew of Philemon, Philemon knew of Paul, but there was never a direct connection or a direct ministry except for the connection through Onesimus. 
Now, does it say that explicitly? No. And I don't want you to uh, say, well, you know, that, that's what it says. Um, that's just assumed by reading and cross-referencing what it says there in the text. So really the only two things we know about Onesimus was he was a slave. And based upon what we understand from the book of Colossians, that he was from Colossae. So then why do we know him? Why does his name stick out? Why is he somebody that we know about in Scripture? What's the story of Onesimus? He supposedly, supposedly took either some money or something, property or something from Philemon. Uh huh. And went to Rome to try to escape from everything and ended up coming in contact with Paul while there. Yes. Yes. So we, and we piece that together because. The dating of the writing of Ephesians and Colossians of Philemon is around 62 A.D. 62 A.D., Paul is, if you follow the timeline, Paul is in Rome and he is imprisoned. He's writing these letters to these different people and to these different churches from prison. And if you read Philemon, verse 1 down through verse 25, that's all that is in there, just verse 1 through 25. As Paul is writing, he is referencing that while he's in prison and while he's where he is at, that he ran into Onesimus. So he says there in verse 9, For yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. So we understand that somewhere Onesimus had left Philemon, his master, and had left Colossae and had traveled, we assume, to Rome where he came in contact with Paul. And while he was in contact with Paul, their relationship started. Most likely a conversion happened. He went from being a runaway slave on the run, trying to hide out, trying to be a nobody in the city, to now being a fellow servant and a, and a fellow worker in the ministry with Paul, we assume that he had stolen something or taken something because if you look down at verse 18, Paul says to Philemon, talking about Onesimus, if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. Um, I, Paul, write this in my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. So Paul says, whatever he owes you, whatever debt there is, I will pay. So people have taken from that to mean that somewhere along the way, most likely Onesimus took something belonging to Philemon. So if, and this would make sense. If you're a slave, and you're one to leave your master and go run, take off, go start a new life, you're probably going to gather up some money, you're probably going to gather up some provisions, you might even grab some clothes or whatever and take off because you don't plan on coming back. So as Paul, um, as then Onesimus gets up there to Rome, meets Paul, and somewhere in the conversation Paul says, Onesimus you got to go back. you got to go back and be reconciled. you got to go back and own up for what you did. you got to go back and take care of what is going on. You get this idea, down there, this, this idea down there in verse 11 where he says, Formerly, he, talking about Onesimus, was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. So, why do we know about Onesimus? Well, one, he was a slave. But then we also know because it's assumed that he deserted Philemon. He fled to Rome. And then somewhere along the way, he encountered Paul while he was in Rome, got saved. Um, and then whenever Paul wrote the letters to Ephesians, Colossae, or Ephesus, Colossae, then he decided to use Onesimus as one of the carriers to take the message back. So you get to like in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 9, and you see where Tychicus and Onesimus were the two that Paul entrusted to take those three letters back to those two churches and back to Philemon. So Paul said, Onesimus, you're never going to be right with the Lord if there is still divisions between men that you need to go and get reconciled. So one of the reasons why I know about him is because of running away as a slave, encountering Paul, and then be coming back in verse 12 to be reconciled. What else, why else do we know about him? Crickets. Crickets. The pizza's got you weighed down. All right? So when, when he comes back, is he coming back just saying, here I am to serve my time? 
Here I am to serve my penance. Here I am to face my punishment. Well, it doesn't really say what he, he just says that he's going back. And Paul says that I, um, this is verse 13, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred nothing to do without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. So pretty much the understanding we get is Paul said to Onesimus, Onesimus, you got to go back. And here's the way I think about it. I can just imagine this conversation. They're sitting there, and Paul looks at Onesimus and says, Onesimus, you're a runaway slave, and you're a great use for me in the ministry, but you're never going to be able to fully minister out of a clean heart and out of a clear conscience unless you go back and you settle this. The, if the gospel is being proclaimed. People are hearing. The, the kingdom is being advanced. And if these things come out, these unsettled things, they have a chance to wreck us. They have a chance to ruin the reputation of the kingdom of God. So Onesimus, you got to go back. And I can just imagine Onesimus sitting there going, but Paul, I can't. Paul, I can't. There is no way. If I go back, I don't know what's going to happen. A runaway slave in that time, they could be killed. Their owners could say, just like a horse thief, you, they could just kill him on the spot. He could have been re-enslaved. Philemon could have said, good, you're back. Dishes need to be done. He could have been put right back where he was. Even worse, he could have been sold to someone of a much more ruthless character. And he could have been mistreated, could have been beaten, could have been flogged, a whole list of things. So I can just imagine sitting there in Rome and Paul looks at Onesimus and says, Onesimus, you got to go back. And Onesimus says, no way, Jose. No way, no way. I'm not just in a different zip code. I'm in a whole different time zone. There is no way that I'm going back. And Paul says, Onesimus, you got to. And eventually, Onesimus then submits to Paul's leading and says, all right, Paul, I'll go back. And I can just imagine Paul then hands Onesimus a letter. And it's all folded up. And in the letter, it says, Dear Philemon, please accept Onesimus and please take him back, not as a servant, but please accept him back as a brother in Christ. And Onesimus spends days traveling on the road. Got three of these, one to the church in Ephesus, one to the church in Colossae, and one that he's taking that he is going to walk back in to wherever Philemon is at. He is going to address Philemon and he's going to give him the letter and pretty much prostrate himself before Philemon for Philemon to do whatever he wishes to do with Onesimus. Now, put yourself in that shoes. Are you going back? Because you think there's a lot of time. I mean, we're not talking about walking across the street. You know, sometimes I can do a lot better with obedience if my obedience is immediate. Now, if you give me three or four days, I can find a justification for changing my mind. So if you look geographically, and you got Rome in Italy all the way up here, and you have got hundreds, over a thousand miles between Rome and Colossae, and you are traveling by foot, there is a lot of time for Onesimus to think, well, Philemon may do this, Philemon may do that, Philemon may not be there, this may not be necessary. Paul doesn't know what he's talking about. And there's a lot of places between here and there for Philemon to go whoop, <laughs> whoop. Man, I can disappear if I disappeared in Rome. I can disappear in Ephesus. I can disappear in Corinth. I can disappear in Thessalonica. I can disappear in Athens. I can disappear a lot of places along the way. And Paul won't know if I showed up or not. Paul won't know if I made it or not. I can go all about my life. And you think about all that time between point A and point B where Onesimus could have changed his mind and he didn't. Some of the reasons why we know about Onesimus it's not just because of his encounter with Paul, but then sometimes we don't even think about what that return trip must have been like. Maybe that's why Paul sent Tychicus and Onesimus together so they had a bit of an accountability. So when Onesimus said, oh, I think I'm going to wander off this way, Tychicus said, no, you're not. We're going that way. 
But if you, if you read, if you read these whole 25 verses, Paul comes in and just says, hey, I'm making an appeal to you, Philemon. He's not saying, Philemon, you have to do this. Not saying, Philemon, I'm forcing you to do this or I'm commanding you to do this. He had no authority over Philemon. He just comes in and appeals to Philemon's relationship to the Lord, appeals to Onesimus' identity in the Lord, and appeals, appeals because of who Onesimus is today, saying, Philemon, please consider who Onesimus is now. That's a good question. So what are some lessons? We think about why do we know him, and that's kind of the nut, that, that's kind of the, the uh, spark notes about the story of Onesimus. So then what lessons are there? How God changed a man from being a slave, and if he probably wasn't saved, he probably would have taken the off road by him <laughs> being saved and turned his heart over. He was trying to do things right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, if you look down there at verse 11, Paul says, formerly he was useless. But now he's indeed useful to, useful to you and me. And the difference was not because he had learned to trade or, or because he had gotten taller or because he had gotten stronger. The difference was because who he was now in Christ. And the difference was that God had changed the man and now the man was fit for a different purpose for the kingdom of God. And that's the difference that God makes. Is that what we're supposed to do today? Yeah. As far as... If we've done something wrong and left, and are we supposed to go back and fix that? I think that if there's the need to be reconciled, then yes. I think scripturally we see that, where it talks about that we should be reconciled to those that we are um, separated from. Does that mean that I need to go back to that kid in fifth grade that I punched in the face and uh, go track him down and say sorry? Um, if the Holy Spirit tells you to, by all means, go track him down and say you're sorry. Um, I think it more means of are there things that need to be reconciled in your life today? Are there things that are hindering your witness? Are there things that are hindering your ability to serve in the kingdom of God? Are there things that are hindering um, your testimony that you might need to go back and own up or apologize for or acknowledge? Yeah. But yeah, you're right, Ron. I mean, it, you see the testimony of, of the difference Jesus makes in a person's life. It's accountability, too. The accountability, that's right. Accountability, not, not only to, to Paul and to Philemon, but also to God. Yes. He, he, had, he had a change of heart, and so now he's accountable to God for his actions. And is this a, is this a part of his repentance? <coughs> Obviously, he was accountable to Paul because we have the letter to Philemon. Right. Yes. Accountability. What's another lesson we may learn from? Yes, sir. I would say faith. Okay. I think I look at it and I think, well, obviously you had faith in God that it was going to work out with him going all the way back, you know, and I think, you know, if I would have had more faith in my life, I think, think of where I'd be. Right. Because I bet I wouldn't have got there, you know. Yes. I would have got half a day into it and I would have said, I think this place looks better, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm right there with you, Matt. I mean, because you think about, he walked, he walked. Yeah. He didn't ride. He didn't fly. He didn't teleport. I mean, he walked all that way with that letter in his hand, knowing I'm going to go give this to this, this guy. And I don't know, this guy may immediately take me and hang me. This guy may take, and fly. who knows what's going to happen. I'm going to give this letter to this guy. And I don't know if this guy is going to receive it or not receive it. And uh, just that faith that said, I'm going to do it because it's the right thing to do. Yes, and it doesn't tell us. So like, so like I think about when you go back to the book of Nehemiah, and in the Old Testament times when they would sing correspondence, of course they would sometimes put the seal, the little wax seal, and, they would, and that way when the messengers would go, the messengers, if they opened it, then the receiver of the letter would know that it had been opened. And so when you go back to Nehemiah, there were some times in there when Samballot and Tobiah and Gershom, Maybe the name's wrong. But anyways, that they were sending letters to Nehemiah to try to intimidate Nehemiah. And what they would do is they'd send 
unsealed letters. That way the messengers could open it up and read it. And then the news, that was like their version of getting the gossip out, right? Before you had social media and before you could do prayer requests, um, veiled as gossip channels. And uh, so you had this thing where they would send these open letters to Nehemiah. Well, the messengers would have read it and they would have known what was being said. So therefore they could say, this is what Sanballat is saying to Nehemiah. Well, you get here in this, we don't have any indication whether Paul is sealing them or Paul is leaving them as an open letter. So we really don't know which way it went. But either way, Onesimus knows this letter is going to go to Philemon. <laughs> and I'm going to assume it's about me. <laughs> he might have, but then if it's sealed, then that's... Sure. Yeah. Maybe he couldn't read. That's a possibility. One thing I think about with, those, with these two, when Onesimus left Philemon, he wasn't a Christian. Philemon was. And so he didn't see, he probably couldn't see the heart that Philemon had then. But once he was converted, possibly him and Paul had a discussion that, you know, you have to think about the heart Philemon, Philemon's going to have. Right. Or if he was a brother in Christ, rather than a person who's done him wrong. Right. And so maybe that was a part of his, you know, I can have a little bit better faith and, and better hope that things are going to turn out better sure. than what I would expect. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. There's lots of it that is that is built in there for sure. One last one. Verse 21. There's a, there's a sentence in here that I, that I just, that I ponder on. Paul is writing, he's writing to Philemon, he's writing about Onesimus, and he says, Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Now, I try to go back and look at that and try to say, what is Paul saying? As he's writing Philemon, is he saying, you're going to do it, and I know you're going to do it, like is in an intimidating way? Is he writing it saying, I am confident in a humble way? Is it in a arrogant way? Is it a sarcastic way? I don't know if we can really tell from the text. But here's what sticks in my mind. When it comes to what is obedience in my life, how Confident is the Lord in me. So when Paul is writing to Philemon, he says, I'm confident that you're going to do the right thing. I'm confident that you're going to be obedient. When Jesus Christ thinks about Spence, is he confident that Spence is going to be obedient? Could someone write this to me saying, Spence, there's something that you need to do. You need to forgive somebody. You need to welcome somebody. You need to accept somebody. And you need to rejoice in what Christ has done in somebody. And before you even answer, I am confident that you're going to do the faithful right thing. Could they say that about me? Could they say that about you? That sticks in my mind. That sticks in my mind, this idea that as he's writing, he's able to say, confident of your obedience. And I think to myself, what would it look like if this entire church was the kind of Christians and the kind of believers that Christ was confident of our obedience? What a difference that might make in a community. What a difference that might make in a church life if it was full of people that God was confident in our obedience. Does that make sense? I mean, it's one of those things that's just, it's just a challenge. I, I wonder, it's one of those things that I'd love to, um, in heaven one day, say, Paul, you know, what do you mean by that? I mean, Paul, how, how, were, how were you in, in, inferring that? I mean, was that like a, a mafia type thing? You're making me an offer you can't refuse? I mean, what, 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 is, what is the point of that? But then I think, well, what does it matter what the point of it was? The question for me, the application for me is, can this be true about me? Does this church, 
Do my brothers and sisters in Christ, does my wife, do my children, does my family, do they have confidence in my obedience? And if not, what do I need to do different today so that these people in my life today will have confidence in my obedience tomorrow? So those are some lessons that uh, I think that he teaches us. Anything else stick out to any of you all? So there are some legends that are out there. One of the leading legends is that um, Onesimus was reconciled to Philemon, and he was accepted by Philemon, and then that later on Onesimus became the bishop or the head leader in the church of Ephesus. Um, there's three different cities that are mentioned in Jewish history. And there's three different um, theories that are out there that either he was the leader of all three of those cities at different times or he was the eventual leader of the church of Ephesus after Timothy left on the scene. Nothing, nothing that we can draw from Scripture itself, but we can draw from legend or even church history writers where they talk about Onesimus and that character coming up and that possibly being reconciled to Philemon, then he worked his way up um, through the ministry of the church and was eventually the leader of the church in Ephesus is a theory that's out there. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Verse 15. Yes, sir. I just see the, the sovereignty of God, but also the power of the gospel to change lives. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. Verse 22. Uh-huh. Am I reading this right? No. Paul is saying, go ahead and prepare a place for me because I'm planning on coming back to you as you pray for, right? Don't we all wish that sometimes, maybe not you all, but I wish sometimes I'm like, man, if I just, I could stop off here and spend some time just knowing he might show back up. That's that accountability to, I mean, he had somebody with him to be accountable to, but the thought that Paul might show back up and what happens if I'm not there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's similar like where we've been at in Luke in our Bible reading where he talks about being ready when the Lord is coming back and talking about that if the master of the house or the, the servant of the house had known what time the master was coming back, he would have been ready. And so we have an opportunity to be ready. And they're like, you're talking about Mo in our Bible reading just today in 1 Corinthians 15. He, he makes a statement there in verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace towards me was not in vain. And in my, my journal, um, my prayer journal, I just I, I focused in on that idea was not in vain. You know, and I'm just thinking of all the things that Christ has done for me. Let my life not be one that He did it in vain because of my disobedience or my lack of faithfulness or my lack of pursuit. All right. Well, I'm glad that you all were here. Mr. Anderson, would you close us in order of prayer? And we'll go home.